Good morning, everybody. How you doing? Dan, can you hear me? Awesome. Good job. Um, so today I wanted to uh, do a review of some products that you might be using that that are working for you. Uh, some things that may not maybe take the temperature on some of these um, like listing referral services. Um, and I've been helping a couple of agents, uh, you know, set up some every door direct uh, mail for, you know, really old, old, old school um, farming. And I forget where, where I heard it, um, but I know that might have been like on a Tom Ferry event or somewhere where everybody's saying we need we need listings, we need listings, we need listings. And the question was, you know, what activities are you doing, you know, for several hours on a consistent basis every day? You know, maybe it's an hour and a half, two hours. And when I ask agents that, I kind of get a blank stare. Um, and I don't know, Colleen, I see you're you're there. Uh, can you hear me okay, Colleen? So um you know, I'd say, you know, are there activities that you're doing on a consistent basis that are or are not working? And if they are, you know, maybe, you know, share with us, you know, what those are. I know some people are are um, using th tools like HomeBot. I, I don't know if we're just using them or if they're working. I know some people were doing a CMA a day. Um, you know, what, what, um, what tools and resources are are working for you, what's not, you know, or are we using Vulcan? Is that a uh, red X? Is that working? Is that a waste of time? You know, I just want to get this forum so that we can reinvest in things that are working and that uh, you're using. Can anybody speak? I don't know if I can, maybe I can't hear. Maybe nobody's talking. Zillow leads were working well, but now they stopped coming. So I think we should reinvest in the Zillow leads. So you're saying, you know, Zillow, um, I mean, my, that, that's uh, Lisa, right? Yes, hello, Lisa. Rob, this is Lisa from Florida. Okay, I mean, I think, I think, um, you know, Zillow is, um, you know, something that, you know, can maybe be a part of our business, but I feel like right now, you know, if you had a hundred Zillow leads, what's the biggest problem? Lisa? Managing them all. Uh, well, even if you could manage them, is there enough inventory to sell 100 people or is that a challenge? Well, I would find it. All right. You're an exception. Um, but I think, you know, I think we also need to balance because that's going to get us, what, 95% of buyers, correct? Yes, correct. Lisa? We need sellers. And, and, yes. Right. And, and how do and how do we, and I, I almost feel like the, um, the, um, the, the buyer lead portal is an easy way um, and maybe even a lazy way to just throw money at getting some instant opportunities instead of investing long term in the business. And, um, you know, uh, then we just keep becoming more and more dependent on, you know, uh, chasing buyers, increasing our budget. Somebody else then goes and spends more money on a zip code. And then, you know, who, who buys Zillow? that who buys Zillow directly from them? Anybody on the call that wants to share? Anybody? So I'll, I'll share with you because I know um, one of our agents was buying Zillow and the competitor went and their $1,400 got them to the number one spot in a relatively small zip code here. Somebody else came and spent more money. Now they're at 80%. So for them to go up to 100, they have to spend another $400. Then what do you think the competitor is going to do? You know, Lisa, what do you think? To get like number one spot. They're, they're, just probably... gonna, they're gonna spend more so they can get more share. Right, and, and we're just enriching Zillow's pocket. And, and I'm, not trying to, I'm not trying to dismiss what you're saying in any way, Lisa, because I know you're awesome at converting Zillow. Um, and I have that down here, but I want to see what other things perhaps are we doing and what can we be doing more of? And we have 36 people on here. Is anybody that does mailing to a farm at least once a month that you know, can, you know, make a contribution here or chime in out of 36 people? 
Yes, I've been doing that, but what I have got out of it from its rentals so far, I've been uh, mailing to my multifamily clients. Okay, and how many pieces, Myra? A month. I I do once a month. Where um, what I'm doing is like on their anniversary, I send them mail, and then once a month, I send them the printout of the how the market is doing. How many people is that? On, on my database, um, about I mail about thirty people. Okay. So what I'm suggesting, Myra, is to look at a farm area that's significantly larger than that so that we can have um, the percentages on our side. Okay. And, and I'm actually, you know, and, and it's not only about, you know, direct mail, or it's not about using HomeBot or a, a referral service. It's about you know, committing to getting some more business on the listing side and using different resources. Um, does anybody on this uh, on the call use Homelight, Ideal Agent, UpNest, any of, uh, or even Ramsey? Um, and you know, care to share if those are, are are doing better or worse, the same as they've been? How are those performing? And are they you know zip code oriented? You know, where are they? Buddy, because I know um, I'm talking to a uh, a team about uh, coming on. They're trying to just coordinate um, their pending, business. and you know they get, you know, uh, I'm going to say one third to maybe even more than that of their listings were coming from, you know, third party sources. You know, I don't want to you know give all the names, but you know, things like Home Light and UpNest. And uh, massive, massive referral fees, but they're doing a lot of volume. And Rob, I've yeah. been doing, I've been doing, uh, I'm sorry to cut you off there. But, um, Go ahead. I was doing uh, success mail, uh, just listed, under contract, just sold. And uh, this year has been terrible for the response. I also do absentee owner. Uh, postcards. And again, the response has been terrible to things that uh, have always worked in the past. So um, I'm not sure why <laughs> the market's really bad or I got bad. I don't know. I don't think so. Uh, but the things that were working before are really difficult this year. Right. And, and I think, Joe, part of this is, you know, we go way, way back and, you know, we, we need to have these times where we re revisit, you know, what we're doing and look at, you know, what's providing the return. And would, would that be fair to say since we go, we go back to the 90s? I'm always open to learn and to get better and and be at the forefront. So um, and what I, I, I and what I'm what I'm suggesting is maybe even having a, a greater magnifying glass on how we're spending it and sharing, you know, what is working and what's not working. And I don't know, are your absentee lists are they constantly refreshed, or are you mailing to similar or the same lists? No, I absent. I absolutely update it. Um, I've spread it a little bit further this year by narrowing down the tax records of anyone that's owned the property for five years or more. Okay. Uh, so yes, we've tried different, yeah, we always refresh the list and do all that. Anytime I do a mailing, I, I peruse the list, I clean it up, I look for duplicates and I look for other realtors, I take them off and look for recent sales. So yeah, we pay close attention to the list, I like to think, because I don't like wasting money. And, and Joe, are you um, comfortable sharing like what type of uh, annual investment do you make in you know, these lead generating efforts? Ugh, it varies. Yeah. So let me think for a minute. I tr this year I'm giving myself a budget. Um, I'm gonna say about 800 a month. So you're about 10, 10 grand roughly. Yeah. 
And um, what's the average sale price where you're marketing go? Uh, 450, 550? No, we never got up that high. It's just, it's around 400 where we are. And uh, what, what's the your average list side? Are you two and a half, three, three and a half, two? Well, the older I get, the older I get, the better I get at that. So <laughs> I've been doing uneven commission split uh, a little bit more now. So I, I do five. When I do six, I'll do uh, three, three and two. When I do five, I'll do two and a half, 2.75 or 2.25. I look to see what the other agents are doing uh, around the area. So. The EXP people and uh, Keller Williams, they're all getting desperate and they're dropping their commissions. So you you um, look at what the, the preponderance is in that area and then you do it that way. We're kind of going a little bit off, but so your average is what, like two and three quarters? Uh, let's say two and a half. Okay, so that's 10 grand. I try to get more when I can, but two and a half is a uh, staple. Okay, and um, <clears throat> so it's ten grand. And what's a solid listing referral? You know, what would you pay for a, a you know, a solid listing referral? Uh, only twenty five percent. People try to get more. I won't take it. We work too 25%. hard. So, um, so you need, based on your budget, you need four transactions a year. And are you seeing that now, or? No, it's been really, it's, it's just been really slow. And I'll be honest with you, I'm just uh, enjoying a downtime. Uh, 29 years at this, and I don't want to, I don't want to demotivate anyone. But you know, uh, just as a sideline, it, it took me 15 years to not get scared. By that, I mean, every year we had a slowdown, or we went through the, uh, the past uh, periods when the when the market dropped off. And I would get nervous like most people and think, you know, I've done something wrong. We're going out of business, but it always comes back. And so for the past year, I've been, you know, I've been working hard, but not killing myself because I know this is a, a lull and we're OK and it's going to come back. So um, I may not be the best person to answer that question right now. OK. So I'm just trying to look something up here while we're chatting. We have Zillow. We spend about 500 bucks a month on Zillow. It was getting home light leads and they died. Okay. Does anybody have um, used HomeBot successfully? Anybody use HomeBot unsuccessfully? I never heard of it. Anybody anybody uh, use HomeBot that's able to chime in? I know that there's uh, like a dozen people that I know of that are using it. Don't see any of them on here. Um, I don't know, Steve Van Ness, are you able to chat? Yeah, we um we do use Homebot. It's been it's been good. It's a good extra follow up method. I don't know that I've necessarily got any listings from it, but I've um I've gotten leads to perk up from it for sure. And um, how about your CMA? Uh, like sending out unsolicited CMAs. Were you participating in that event? And doing those things or I do send them out not as much as Glenn would probably like us to or you know as much as he does but um yeah I have personally haven't sent enough out to see a big enough return on them have you had any um uh transactions that you can tie to the CMA activities that you do I'm sure Glenn does he talks about it all the time personally I don't um, 
because I think, you know, activities, you know, unsolicited CMAs, you know, um, you know, I know Glenn's talked about the um, return for doing that. And I, I would imagine if you, you know, did one or two of those a day for two months, it would probably be hard not to get a listing appointment or maybe even a transaction. I don't know, would you, did you try it that long, Steve, without success or? Uh, no, I have not tried it that long, one or two a day. They're, they're pretty time consuming. So I was doing a lot of door knocking. So just a matter of managing the type of prospecting that I want to do. Um, but I would say, yeah, if you're doing a couple of day, two, three, four a day for a couple of months, you're, you're definitely bound to get something. And how long, how long are you spending to do that CMA? The CMA itself doesn't take that long, but if we send a video out with it, then that's a little more time consuming. So uh, maybe a half an hour for each one. Okay. Probably a little less once you, you know, get in the rhythm of it. So, so I, from my vantage point here, I see that there is an absolute imbalance of inventory and, you know, Lisa, I, I acknowledge that Zillow's on the list of things here, but I think, you know, the solution to abundance here is listing activity. And I think listing activity um, evades us probably because of intent, purpose, and consistency. And, um, you know, I don't have hard results on it yet, but there's four or five agents, um, actually probably going to be more by the time I'm done working with our leadership team doing targeted marking areas, targeted mailing areas um, by looking at turnover rates, you know, sales prices and uh, dominant agents. And I'll repeat that, um, you know, a selected farm area, which is um, identified by um, turnover, um, sales price, and uh, if there's a dominant agent in that area. And what I'm saying is not that I'm going to completely avoid dominant agents, but if there's an area where nobody controls the market, do you think it might be easier to enter into that marketplace than if somebody has 20% market share? I mean, my, my thought is... Yeah, my thought, it's like, it's a no brainer, you know, you can, you know, you can then rise to become that dominant person. And the whole, you know, that the initial peer to peer um, discussion that we had was with Lori Caruso, who built a career, and to this day has a solid annuity of a business from, you know, two farm areas, and, you know, she mails them calls and visits them. Um, regularly, I believe still twice a month. And if my, my memory is correct, it's a fifty to sixty thousand dollar investment that pays two hundred and fifty to close to four hundred thousand dollars a year in commission income. And that's what I'm these are the things that I think that we need to do. I think maybe uh, somebody said, was it Joe? Did you say that you used home light or up nest? Who said they I used, used that? Home, <clears throat> I used home light <clears throat> for several years they were doing pretty good they also raised their referral fee which i don't like uh, and they also changed how they operate they're giving leads to multiple people at the same time so i don't really appreciate that uh, at, at all human they they uh, failed to grandfather you into your old rate huh oh there's no such thing yeah. <laughs> so so um Rob, yeah, I want to I want to say something. In in all the studies that I've done in in our territories, I really have never seen an agent dominate an area. I have to be honest about that. As a matter of fact, we worked with oh years ago in West Windsor. You might remember, I actually asked the top agent if she had any idea what her percentage was, and she had no clue. So the average agent doesn't have a clue of what uh, of what numbers are. And I like to stay really close to numbers and look at them. It's really easy. But you're going to find that there's hardly any agents that I that I see dominate a particular area, which is basically what I'm saying is don't let that 
stop you from going after an area. You just have to do what was mentioned before. Consistency is what works. Setting a budget, sticking to the budget and doing it is what works. Can't be all things to all people. Um, I think it was uh, Mike Ferry might have said, keep your, keep your focus small. Right. Uh, let me just see here. What are the two? Does anybody know what the two uh, main zip codes in Jefferson Township are? At 07438 and 07869. Um, one, one is, one is, one is uh, Lake Apaca and the other one is Oak Ridge. Okay. Let me just see here. And uh, Steve, you know Lake Apacon off the top of your head? Yeah, that's, uh, well, part of it's going to be 07849, the Jefferson part of Lake Apacon. Okay. I'm just trying to test Joe's uh, theory here. Not that I don't believe it. I just wanted to kind of maybe take a look here. So, um, is the... Thirteen out of one twenty nine. So um, let me just share this real quick. So if you were on this call and thinking of uh, working in the part of Jefferson where Lori Caruso is, I would probably advise against it. She has thirteen listings out of one hundred and twenty nine total in the market. And she happens to have the uh, 650 average sale price versus, see what the uh, overall average is. It looks like it uh, probably is significantly lower than that because there's a lot of them in the twos and fours. So to a large degree, Joe, I'd agree with you. But I mean, if you're in an area where somebody is mailing regularly and has a, a solid market share, I'd probably say that it's at least worth looking into before you make that investment. And you know, uh, I can I can run these reports for you to tell you who's um, who's doing business in a particular area if you would like, or your your manager can run that for you in New Jersey, except for. Um, Trend Joe, I don't have that access. I can probably get it. And um, in Florida, I'm not sure exactly how Fazia can slice and dice it, but we do have reporting software down there as well. Rob, I'm just curious, how many homes sold last year in that zip code that you just looked at? 129. Not many at all. So you're saying that agent had, and how many did she do last year? So she had 13 in that zip code. Of the 129, so she had 10%. Yeah. Yeah, I think what I was saying is that I've never seen anyone with 20%. I've so, seen top eight, people who think that top agents have 5%. So, 10% so, is pretty healthy. So Joe, in her farm area though, which is a, a significantly smaller subset of that, um, there's a uh, hundred, there's, th let's say that there's 350 homes in that sub area. So she did 13 sales out of 350. And I don't know how many were in there, but my get, you know, she can tell you exactly. Um, and I believe in 2022, which this number rolls 12 months. You know, she had like 104% market share, which means that you know, if there were, you know, 26 sales, you know, she compete, she participated in 27 transaction sides because there's a listing and a buy side. And she overall, um, probably 80% of her business is listing. So not to dispel it, there are outliers and there are people that do have some pretty dominant areas. And my, my question to us on this call is, you know, why can't that be us? You know, let's take a smaller area. Let's look at what the turnover is. Let's figure out how we can dominate it and let them back into the budget and see if it makes sense. You know, I think 20% is, 
you know, 25% uh, marketing budget for an area is reasonable to get to that area. But I look at it, everybody kind of knows what they're supposed to do, but there are very, very few people that, you know, take the action and put the money where their mouth is. And sometimes it's easier to invest money in a platform or pay a referral fee than it is to take the initiative and also understand that it's going to take, you know, three to six months before you start to see a result. Right. And now in, in a, um, down market a lot of people aren't willing to do that investment right a lot of people just want the referral with the referral fee and they'll pay you know 35 40 percent um has anybody seen any listing service that charges more than 35 percent i think i think ideal anybody take leads from ideal agent So I, I think uh, in talking to agents who are um, entertaining coming over here and I look at where they're spending their money, I recall um, one of the uh, one of the candidates paying 42 percent and it just kept escalating up, like Joe said, from, you know, 25 to 30 to 35 to 40. Now it's up to 42 percent. So if you were to take that money and repurpose that into doing a marketing budget, I don't know if if Mario is on here or not. Susanna Costa, you know, both of them had come to me about, you know, helping identify a farm area. Um, you know, we talked about one of the areas um, where they were farming, I knew was very unfriendly to door knocking, which I think is part of the mix. And um, you know, the, the agent said, oh, you can't door knock there. It's not allowed, right? I called the township and it's, it's a $99 annual fee. You have to get fingerprinted and um, it takes about four to six weeks to get it done. So it's not that it's not allowed, it's that most agents don't wanna A, spend the money, don't want to wait the time and not know if they're actually going to do it. Um, Colleen, do you know if uh, any areas in Florida require permits for door knocking? Yes, yeah, several. Yeah. And uh, we do have agents that have gone out and got the permits and also introduced themselves to the um, the association and let them know that they would be willing to sponsor or help with events. So that's sort of a backdoor way to get in there. In, in your career, Colleen, how many people have you known that have you know, made door knocking one of their top two or three prospecting activities and done it consistently? Well, <laughs> Till I joined you, no one. Uh, but now, yes, we have several uh, agents that door knock every single day, and they do uh, produce uh, business. And, and, and they have good follow up, and they send thank you notes. And you, you probably, you know, managed, you know, well over five hundred or a thousand agents in your career, right? And there was nobody before. Oh, easy. Absolutely. Okay. So, you know, it frustrates me for everybody's perspective that we sit around and we say we need more listings, yet, you know, to some extent, you know, it really is upon us. And um, I, I remember now where I heard the comment. It was at the R4, and I believe it was Jared James who... In, in front of the large audience for the 50th anniversary of Remax, everybody's hooting and yelling. And he's like, you know, uh, whose market is low on inventory, right? Everybody raising their hand. My area is low on inventory, right? Who wants to get more listings? Ooh, the crowd gets even louder, right? And then he goes, who every single day spends two hours intentionally working to um, to get new listings. And I'm not paraphrasing his, uh, his linguistics correctly, but there's like two people. 
and there's probably seven or 8,000 people in this stadium. And there are two people standing up, waving their arm. And I was like, oh my God, this is an opportunity, right? Because, you know, I know that if people were doing it every day, they would be proud to raise their hand and say, I'm doing it, right? So I just say this not to be critical, but because I really want to make a difference. And I believe there's going to be, um, maybe it's not a, uh, a true abundance of listings coming up, but there's going to be a normalized distribution of home sales coming up. And I'm going to just see for a second. I want to give everybody a visual because I think this is helpful. I was just opening up too uh, Rob, many Rob, while you're doing that, uh, I did have an agent that was extremely successful sending out the pre-listing packages. Uh, he sent them to um, for sale by owners and expired listings. And every time he sent them out, and he sent out a lot, he was probably sending, uh, I'd say, 20 a day. Uh, mm -hmm. Every week he had a listing. Every single week. He, he went from a agent that did a fair amount of business to being a top agent. So there is opportunity there. And, it's, and especially in the area, there's another place that people tend not to look. Oh, no one ever moves from there. If you yep. plant the seed, uh, like you spoke of before, send out maybe a postcard. If you could move anywhere, where would you like to go? You know, what what is your dream? If you put the thought into people's heads and then you start working that area, you'll get listings. Um, let's see. Here. So what I'm going to just share with you, and this is something that um, that Colleen knows from being in the business a long time, is that you know, the, the uh, inventory, it rises and it falls, but over time it normalizes because people structurally need to move. If people can't, because interest rates are low, they can't stop um, outgrowing homes. They can't stop, you know, empty nesting. They can't stop having to take the natural cause of natural life cycle where maybe they need to go to a single floor living, then they need assisted living and things of that nature. Um, it's just not possible for the, you know, the economics of real estate to change um, uh, the physiology of people, right? People need to make changes. And at some point, you know, uh, does anybody know anybody that bought a car during the pandemic when prices were like 30,000 more than, or 50,000 more than list price? Anybody know anybody, maybe even really intimately like yourself? that bought a car and you said to hell with it, I need a car, I'm gonna buy it anyway. Anybody? So here is the chart. You know, you're gonna see a, a floor, you know, in home sales, even during, you know, the, the low of the lows in the, you know, $4 million range. And I think as we as we go down, everything that goes up eventually comes down, everything that goes down. So if we're not positioning ourselves to take advantage of that, and we're just going to be randomly taking the um, taking what the market gives us. Um, I mean, we have some of the most talented people here. I, I, I'll you know take the charge with you, but. I think that we have a unique opportunity to start to, you know, invest in building relationships, you know, marketing ourselves in something that's different than than where we were before. I know one of our agents, um, you know, as morbid as it sounds, combs the um, obituaries in some local papers, and the reality is those people need services. Okay, it's not. Um, it's not a gruesome task. It's, hey, you know, I'm going to you know, provide value in, in the time that you might need my services. Okay. Um, 
Uh, Rob, I want to add something about the, the farm area. Maybe this might be helpful. Um, was something I've done many, many years ago, continue to do it. Um, and this might be basic, but what you want to do is analyze an area, a particular neighborhood or whatever, you know, set a budget, um, an idea of what you think you want to spend. Um, but let me back up a minute. So if if you select an area and then look at what the uh, output is going to be, uh, we'll just make up numbers. Let's say, you know, 15 homes are going to sell and that's going to be X amount of dollars in commission. And if you do a 5%, if you were able to do 5%, because 20% is really high, it might be unrealistic. But if you if you own 5%, what commission is that going to generate to you? And then if that's uh, if that's a hundred thousand dollars in commissions, then you know you said twenty percent, ten to twenty percent of a budget should be spent uh, killing that area with uh, various marketing, postcards or whatever. Does that make yeah. sense to you? Yeah. Right? Yeah. So ident identify the area, identify what the potential for commissions uh, is. If you own five percent of that area. You should be investing 10 to 20 percent of the uh, possible commissions that you can earn. The other thing that doesn't seem to come up a lot in these calls um, is your individual website. I truly believe, and I've had great success. It's I'm revamping a couple of things right now. People are on the internet. They're on their phone. They want to sell their house. Do you come up in a search? And Rob, if there's anything that you have resources that could help us, um, I have always been a big advocate that that's something that could help us. And, you know, I was pretty upset with if you go searching, you don't see Remax at the top anymore. And they're all, you know, paying for leads. I understand that, but we're not coming up. But you can uh, do some various keywords and programming on your website to come up in specific areas. I have, for example, I have, uh, <clears throat> I have some town home developments that are specifically are on my website and I'll get phone calls, people asking me, um, you know, about HOA questions. So they're very powerful. Yes, they're annoying. But the fact that I came up associated with a particular development, that's pretty cool. So, hey, Rob, right. Rob, I yeah. want to comment on that real quick. Uh, it's Foz, by the way. So when um, you're speaking about coming up and on the search engine, you know, I spent quite some time doing that for Florida. And it's imperative and so important when uh, the agents spell the word REMAX and or use the word REMAX that it's in all caps and it has the correct hyphen. When you don't brand yourself the correct way with the correct branding, you won't come up and you're doing yourself a disservice, especially when you're using Google as the mother internet that feeds to every single social media site that you're looking at. So it's important when you use the word REMAX, it's spelled in all caps. And and, and I think Fozzie, Joe's also, and Joe, you can, chime in here, but you're talking about like, um, what's one of the communities that that you are an expert in, like a uh, condominium or um, cluster housing community? Um, Abbott Commons in so, Hamilton. A-B-B-O-T-T -T or something spelled yeah, like that? If you, yeah, if you enter that in, I come up. That's just one example. Right. So that's what I, I'm saying is to identify yourself with the individual uh, developments in your area. And, and, and these are, you know, these are other um, great ideas, Joe, that I think most people, you know, probably, you know, don't follow up with. And do you put new content on whatever presence you have for Abbott Commons? Um, you could do, you could do a search. I have a basic setup, but uh, you can connect a search to it so you can get the active listings in that development. <clears throat> you do a feed to that page. 
So I, I know that um, on KV Core, Boomtown, um, other, uh, I'll call them mass sites, you can create um, links to close sales, which are not available on the IDX feeds. It requires a little bit of manual work. Um, and there are some of the agents that religiously post their um, sales and activities there so that they rank higher. For example, in Abbott Commons, that would be a way that you could elevate your Google search or your Bing search, whatever you know, search you're using to, to appear there. And again, I'm not the expert at doing that, but I do know that you can create like a, a sub page to your website on almost all the major web providers and you can upload the sold data, which is not IDX available. Is that a sub page to your KV Core website, Rob? Uh, you can do it as a sub page to KV Core as well. Yep. And you can create a lot of different sub pages and you just link them back to your main KV Core page. It does require a little bit of effort. And more importantly, it requires updating. Otherwise, it, you know, people go there and they, they don't see what's happening or the link is broken. They're not going to stay there. Do you know of agents that have had success building community pages on the KV Core platform like that? I do not know off the top of my head, uh, but I can ask Brandon or Fred to see if they can find out. Just wondering if that's an extra like advantage for SEO. A good I, I one know. to uh, a good one to use to get you uh, placement with the uh, SEO is which condos uh, take pets because it's always hard to find which condos you can have a dog in. Uh, I had an agent that specialized in that, and they did very very well because everybody would go to their site to find out which condos take pets. That's a great yeah. value add. That's a good one. And, um, you know, there's a um, an agent that unfortunately is not with us um, yet, who uh, has a site in uh, Hudson County where it actually competes with a lot of the meat. And unfortunately, the agent might spend more time on the site than selling houses. Um, uh it's just you know if your if your website comes up the top five when you 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 do um you know let's just say it's uh maxwell building in hoboken or condo sales in jersey city and your site's one of the top five or six especially if you put like closed condo sales you know that means that you're ranking um and you know this particular person does put a lot of work into it um that's another avenue that you can use i love the idea about pets um who people have their their pets and that's an important uh component um maybe even educating you know people you know new jersey and florida i think there's a lot of information out there and a lot of it's probably not accurate in terms of you know buying condos and in Florida with insurance is something that you might be able to add value um, when you're doing it. Um, but if you're if you're saying I want more listings and you're not consistently doing some activity or some investment consistently for you know say a minimum of an hour a day for five days a week that's five hours. How bad do you want it if you're not making that investment in time? And, and it could be a little bit of time, a little bit of money. It could be a lot more time, a lot less money if you're doing optimizing and posting stuff on your website. If you're doing a farming and you take the numbers and you run them backwards, like um, you know, like Joe had mentioned, where you know you take a look at what's your average commission how many sales you need to get, um, have a modest target of maybe 5% of the sales and then commit to doing it. 
Um, and I'm going to put Colleen on the spot again and say, of the people that start form mailing, Colleen, how many of them stop before it gets to the critical mass in your career? And would you say with your company and with outside? 75%. I mean, I think it's at least that, if not even higher, right? They start. Yeah. They do it exactly. for three months. They do it for three months, six months. And they're like, Colleen, I don't have any listings from it. I'm going to stop it. Right. right. That's it's just when too much you're... money. It's not working. Correct. That's just when you're, you know, starting to have top of mind, right? Yeah. Like who, who would, who would run a, a TV commercial um, on the Super Bowl, spend $10 million. And if by Monday they don't have the 10 million back, say, I'm never going to do that again. You know, just that it's not logical. It doesn't make any sense. You know, you have to have the right expectation and consistency. Um, and exactly. I just try to, and I try to connect people, Colleen, who, who I see who have done the things that most people don't, and maybe have done them with a higher level of conviction, so that it does yield the result. And uh, you know, we have, yes. I would say that when in the past, when I found success doing the mailings, it, it was when I committed to the team that we would do at least twelve. So, if we did twelve. Yeah, we had a listing appointment or we could have a listing or two beforehand, but it was sometimes six, nine, 10 months before, like you said, like it started really hitting. And then I noticed a lot of times people will just send out one or two. They don't even have a plan. The most successful time in, in my career when we did mailers was when we designed them with, with three, four, six months in advanced designs. So we weren't thinking about what's going out on them. We already had that template. Right. So we're just focused on our on our work. And these are already kind of like on autopilot. And that's when we found the most success, because if not, a lot of agents are playing catch up. What do we put on it? What are we going to do? When's it going out? Who's batching? Is, is it right? Is it wrong? What's the copy look like? But if you could get organized in advance with the mailings and have it set up for, for the next year in, in a in an area where you're really um, confident then you're going to be successful. Dave, what's, what do you think is the optimum farm size that you can, you know, stay hyper local, um, not have it be a burden where you're worried about, am I going to get the mailing, you know, the content prepared? Um, and, and there's no right or wrong answer. What's your gut on that? Every agent has a different comfort level of what, you know, kind of money out every month. Like I think you mentioned, most people are, are uh, hesitant to make a commitment in advance to spend money. Um, but in the past, uh, we were successful with anywhere between 300 to about 800 uh, addresses monthly. And when we found success in one neighborhood or, or country club, or for example, like in a Boca Raton, what we would do is we would just double down and it would go from 500 to 1,000, 1,000 to 2,000. As soon as something starts clicking, you just keep you know, pouring more gasoline on it. So I, um, I met with an agent last Thursday, uh, might have been Friday. They were spending about 3,500 a month on Zillow. Um, they were frustrated with the return on you know, their zip code and the story about somebody else you know, increasing the spend and now making them number two was driving the person crazy. And I said, why don't we talk to, um, you know, whoever's helping you pay for that and see if you can take a thousand dollars and dedicate it to mailings. And I want to say it was almost 600 pieces of mail and it was less than four or three something uh, with every door direct mail. So we were able to, with a 10 cent um, print cost for the mail, I don't know if that's reasonable or not, or 12 cents, get in for a thousand dollars and do two pieces of mail to two complete zip codes in an area where she absolutely wants to dominate and where there was nobody with more than 3% market share. Yeah, we're, we're getting ready to... Uh organize our next uh, year of mailings, Alex and our new agent uh, with Fazia. And I, I'm very confident that where we're planning to do it, we're going to have great success because there's very few people with consistency uh, in, in any of the areas around us. They're all one or two, and then they drop off. It's, it's a common theme. 
And, and um, you know, Dave, this the, the psychology of agents sometimes is like, hey, you know, um, costing me forty two thousand dollars a year. I had the lender pay in half, so that's twenty one thousand. So I'm only paying twenty one thousand. My average commission seventy five hundred. You know, I have my third one under contract. It's not even July, so I'll have it paid for for the year. And I'm just like, yeah, you'll get your money back, but where's the return? And if you only do three more in the second half of the year, then you've paid a 50% referral fee. And I don't think that agents, you know, are always, you know, slicing the math up where they look at it that way. And Joe D, yeah, you made a great comment. Like if I offered you without any financial risk listings at a 50% referral fee, you would politely decline it, right? But yet sometimes people are making these investments and they don't know where the numbers need to be. And I believe that sometimes they do the advertising because somebody's paying half of it, even if it's not a good return for just your half. I Any, think you got to look at it like in the long term about the branding and about being, you know, eventually the market share winner, right? So if you're doing it and you're, you know, it start out and you get six deals in 12 months and that's not enough for you or the person investing your, your title or mortgage broker, whoever is investing the other half. Okay. But then the next 12 months you do 12 and then it just keeps, you know, multiplying. So this is not a short term play this is a longer this should be long term and, and i think that we're chasing the immediate gratification which is you pop a credit card on zillow what's going to happen your phone's going to ring right you invest in mailing it's a little bit of a longer term gain right game but if you know that a certain percentage of homes sell there and mm -hmm. You know, you know that there's nobody with a 10, 15 percent market share. I think that's a great investment to go into. Yeah, I like I like the idea of having the listing over, you know, typically with the with spending in advance on a Zillow or, or realtor buyer lead, having the listing, you can you can get other buyers from doing opens and having agents on your team do opens. But, you know, to to have the listing, to have the sign in the ground, to have that exposure it benefits us in multiple ways. I mean, um, listings is life. Listings is life. Period. If you list, you last. That's what they told me 2005 and it's been the same every year. And, and Joe, right. it's been this, it's been the same since before, uh, before the listings went online, right? Back Correct. in the day when it, when it was the printed books, David, List to last. That's where you control the market. So, anyway, um, you know, I feel like we um, we haven't uncovered a whole lot of secrets, but maybe that's on purpose. Maybe the purpose of it is it's about the consistency. It's about you know, you know, and only a small percentage of us on this call are actually going to do it. But it's about reverse engineering the math just like Joe DiLorenzo knew intuitively. You know, maybe it's about calling and you know talking to your your manager or your broker and finding out, you know, hey, can you help me run these numbers and let's reverse engineer how I can own a, a particular territory. It's having mm -hmm. a plan and sticking to it. Exactly. You know, I, mean, I I understand that you have tools and everything. I'm just, to me, it's so simple. In our bright MLS, you can pull all the solds, for example, you know, in a particular area, you pull the solds for the last year and you, in, you include the column of the, of the list agent. And I also do sales agent. And then you sort on that. And it tells you immediately, you know, in two seconds, uh, what the market share looks like. It's it's pretty simple. And if there's somebody that dominates it and you're intimidated by it, um, then maybe move to another area. But, you know, it's so simple with your local MLS. I'm sure you're able to add these columns um, and just do it pretty easy. It's not It's not rocket science. It's pretty simple. 
You know, I don't know if I, I could think, just like Brad said, the whole thing is to do it. I used so, to have absolutely. a thing on my on my desk that said it uh, was a to it card. Stick to it. <laughs> yep. You know, in, in the beginning of this call, you know, we were talking about um, the market share. And so I have a specific area that I'm looking to concentrate in. And there is a specific agent that does have a controlling market share. But what I was actually able to do was to pull that data from the MLS sold in an IDX feed, put it into a Google map and see exactly where the sales were so that I know where I can hone in on the subset and have some success. So, you know, kudos to everybody who, who's on this call. You know, um, and, and some of the agents that have these farms, you know, we have to go with what the, what the statistics are and what the norms are. And how many agents that sell a house today in seven to 10 years when they go to resell it aren't even in the business or aren't relevant or haven't kept up with the, kept in touch with the people. What do you think that percentage is? So let, let's, take a, let's take a look at, of, of not the agents, but of the sales. Uh, how many people in seven years won't still be in the business that sold that original house? Is it 30%, 60%, 70%? What do you think? At least 60 plus. plus. Yep. So it's it's sixty to seventy percent. So so right there, um, if you keep in touch with the um, the person that bought your listing, or if you keep in touch with somebody that bought a listing, right, that was abandoned, you know, there's no chance for their listing agent to the, the selling agent to, to list that house if they're out of the business, right? So exactly. we're saying like two thirds of them are out of the business. So they're not going to list with the person that sold them the house because that person didn't stay in touch or they're not even in the business. And of the third or 30% that are still in the business, what percentage of those agents do you think religiously keep in touch? 10%? If you're right. lucky. If you're lucky, the other right? Thing, anyway. Go ahead, Rob. The other thing, Rob, is you know, we're, we're having this conversation and we've established that 20%, if somebody has 20%, that's like they control that area. Well, guess what? It still leaves 80%, which is more than enough for somebody else to be a dominant force in that area. So, I mean, I wouldn't even stay away from uh, an area where some one person has 20%. Well, somebody else has got to get the other 80%. Why not you? Right. But, but if, you, if you look at it from the practical perspective, Rob, where you said 10 percent of the 33 percent of the people that are still in the business when they sell. So 10 percent of 33 is 3.3 percent of the people stay in touch with their their past, you know, the person that they sold the house uh, or they bought the house from. That means that there's 96.7 percent that's wide open. Absolutely. That's, that's wide open for us to us to adopt those those orphaned uh, homeowners. Um, I'd also like to add on your mailer, what's the most important thing that should be on your mailer? Is, is, that, a, is that a rhetorical question, Joe? Or is now, that what's the most question? important thing that should be on your mailer? I'm gonna say your contact info. Your name, your name. Because yeah, as course. I've mentioned to many before, look at the postcard on the way to the garbage pail. You come home from work, you get your mail, you stand at the garbage pail and you throw everything away that you're not going to keep. And your name needs to be dominant, your picture, consistency. It doesn't matter what the postcard says. Yeah, just listed, just sold, whatever, mortgage rates, your name, your photo, the most important thing. So someday when somebody's looking for a realtor, they remember your name. They remember who you are. That's the most important thing on a mailer. I get crap to my house all the time. I just laugh at it. Um, you know, people uh, send these mailers that don't make any sense. No, that's just my, just my two cents. So, so I, where I live in Westfield, um, there's nobody that, mails consistently once a month 
Um, what I do get is whenever there's a sale in the area, I get, you know, multiple cards saying just sold, right? And I look at it as a as a consumer, and a lot of times I'll say, hmm, I got two cards from different people saying I just sold this property. You know, uh, you know they don't explain. I listed it and sold it. And I was the bu-. so it, it's confusing. Then I never hear from them again, and I think that's the norm. And my challenge is to stop worrying about the market. If you are doing the right things, you know your numbers, you've created a budget, you know, you will get that return over time. It may take, you know, three to nine months, right? But, you know, how many of us put our credit card on, even if we're sharing it with the lender on Zillow and expect to have a closed sale in time to pay the next month's bill? Nobody does that. Even if the perfect case, you get a a qualified buyer, it takes them 30 days to find a house, 45 days to close. You know, you're into it for four months before you see a paycheck. So let's stop taking a look at the short-term perspective. Let's, you know, take the time to understand the market. And to some extent, Joe, I really applaud what you're saying because if you go to Colleen or one of your managers and ask them to do the work for you, you're less invested in it, to be honest with you. You know, it's probably better if you take the time, you do the work, and then you come, you say, does this look right to you? You know, I've done some research. I've looked at four different areas. I'm thinking I should go here. Here's my work papers for coming up with these four communities I was thinking of mailing. You know, what's your thought? You know, Fazia, Colleen, you know, um, Debbie, Adona, like ask them what are their thoughts? Feed a man fish for one day and they eat for one day. Teach them to fish and they can eat forever. Forever. Yeah. So, hey, Rob, can I ask you a question? This is Emily. So, my, um, my question is in regards to some of the tools that you have to be able to search for, um, you know, for farms that are maybe not uh, being serviced by, you know, a single agent. I know that there's obviously ways in the MLS to look for, you know, condo communities or sub developments and subdivisions and things like that, right? But if I'm looking for a particular geography that may just be an interconnected neighborhood of streets, do we have the capability to search for whether or not that is dominant by a particular agent? The answer to that is yes. Um, that would be, you can do it on the MLS. Um, a donor can do it through real estate statistics. Um, I'm pretty sure Colleen or um, Fazia can do it through their MLS data aggregator. Um, so the answer to that is a resounding yes. Okay, so we can get that granular with it. It's not just going to be a particular zip code. Right, and and. and yeah, what Joe was suggesting, which probably makes a lot of sense, especially when you have a team, Emily, so that, you know, your team members don't come and push it up to you to do all the work, is you can go and look at the streets. You can do a search on the MLS for the town and those streets, and you can look at the data. You can look at the listing agents, to Joe's point, and see who's, you know, who, if anybody, is dominating that particular market. And then if I just didn't know that there was a way to to actually download that data so that I can actually work with it. Because from what I've experienced on the MLS, I can't necessarily pull the data and put it into a spreadsheet to be able to parse that out. So Emily, what I'll do is I'll um, connect with you offline because I think I can. Perfect. Do a, I, I think we can do two or three streets together and then you'll learn how to do it and you'll be able to use it. I'm comfortable with your primary MLS. Some of the other MLSs, I'm not as fluid in. Okay. No, I mean, I I agree with everybody on this call. I think it's an this is an important piece. And funny enough, in my neighborhood, and for anyone on this call who's in the Morristown area, um, you know, we my team we we kind of go full force on farming, and um, you know, I decided I was going to jump into my own neighborhood. And as I'm jumping into my own neighborhood and a bunch of interconnected streets, you know. Coming up on that year, it was, you know, Memorial Day. I put flags out on the lawn. The first day I go out to start putting the flags out, I get a chunk of the neighborhood. The next day I go out, 
And Debbie Bruin has already gotten the rest of the streets in my neighborhood. And so, of course, the following year, I'm like, screw it. I'm going to put my money somewhere else. Why am I going to compete with someone else? Let her have it. I'll pick another neighborhood that nobody's working. So I think that that's something for us all to keep in mind as well, right? Hey, look, we're not we're not going to uh, be cowards to anybody, but I think we're going to look at it wisely and say, you know, if there's a certain amount of business locked up, let's, you know, let's understand our investment, right? You're, you're not going to go and buy, you know, put half your retirement fund into a particular stock without knowing the attributes of it. And I don't think you should invest in building a farm without understanding who the players are and what's the turnover. Well, so, even um, just who else is farming there, right? Because that's the thing. If I'm going to be putting my money and my investment into something and not being a coward about it, but if Debbie Bruin is going to be sending things out twice a month and I'm sending things out twice a month, what I, if I'm thinking about my return on investment, how many are going to go to her and how many are going to go to me? Or I could pick a neighborhood that nobody's farming and I could get all the exposure, right? And I have a much better uh, chance of getting you know, the bulk of the sales in that neighborhood because nobody else is doing it rather than trying to compete with everybody or anybody, right? I couldn't agree with you more. So we're, we're over time, eight minutes. Emily, I'm gonna, I'll connect with you offline in Adona and I wanna thank everybody. Please, you know, think about that stadium, 8,000 people and, you know, who's spending two hours a day trying to get these listings and there's only two people out of 8,000 and Remax is the best of the best. So let's, let's make a commitment. Let's block some time. And, and, you know, as the, the market kind of took a precipitous drop, I think people are going to see, you know, rates come back into the mid fives, high fives, whatever it is, they're going to get a relief of saying, I can now only pay five and a half and move to the house that I want. And I've been deferring. So I think now is the time to get prepared for, you know, the market to come back a little bit and we'll have and hopefully we'll have done. The great productive week, everybody. Thanks for joining me. Thanks Rob. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks, Rob.